Inside this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to decompose a square matrix into a product of elementary matrices. Before we do that, I want to introduce you to a very important theorem. And that theorem says if A is a square matrix and it's invertible, then the reduced row echelon form of A has to be an identity matrix. Now this ties together with a theorem that we saw in lesson 7, and that theorem said B, which was the reduced row echelon form of A, was equal to a certain product of elementary matrices on the left hand side of matrix A. So we've seen this theorem already. Now the one that we're taking a look at right now is just a special case for square matrix when B happens to be equal to the identity matrix. So if the reduced row echelon form is an identity matrix, we can start with A, we can do a bunch of elementary row operations, and we'll eventually get to the reduced row echelon form, which is an identity matrix. The proof of this theorem we're going to talk about in chapter 3. And what I want to do next is just add to that last theorem a little bit. The last theorem gives us that if A is invertible, its reduced row echelon form is going to be an identity matrix. Now remembering that each elementary row operation we do, we can represent as left-sided multiplication as an elementary matrix, we get the following equation. And the question is, if we have this equation, is it possible for us to solve for A? What would we get if we do that? Well, we could multiply both sides by E K inverse. When we simplify on the left-hand side, we know that anything times the identity matrix is just going to be itself, so on the left we'll get E k inverse. And we know that when we have a matrix beside its inverse, we can simplify this to the identity matrix. So this gets us one step closer to solving for A. And we can keep repeating this process, multiplying by the inverse of each elementary matrix until we get to the last one, E1 inverse. So over on the left-hand side, we'll have this expression. And simplifying on the right-hand side, we notice that E1 times E1 inverse, that'll be the identity matrix. So we'd be left over with the identity matrix times A. And that's just A. So now what we have is we have A as a product of elementary matrices. And that's because of a theorem that we saw in the last lesson. The inverse of all of these elementary matrices are also going to be elementary. So we have A decomposed as a product of elementary matrices. Now once again in chapter 3 we're probably going to come back and we're going to prove this in more greater detail. Let's see this last theorem in action. So given this matrix A, let's try to decompose it into elementary matrices. Just like before, our first goal here is to try to get A into its reduced row echelon form. Specifically, we're hoping that we can get an identity matrix. This means that A is going to be invertible and we're going to be able to express it as a product. First, switch row 2 and row 1. After you've done this, you have your first leading one and we can go row 2 minus 3 row 1s. And our last step here to get to reduced row echelon form is to multiply row 3 by 2. And that's going to give us the following identity matrix. Because we get the identity matrix, we automatically know A is going to be invertible. This is important for us because it means that we actually can decompose A into a product of elementary matrices. For our second step, we're actually going to go ahead and create those elementary matrices using the three elementary row operations we did on the previous slide. First, we'll do the operation row 2 switched with row 1 to get the following elementary matrix. We're going to call this elementary matrix E1 because it's going to represent the first elementary row operation we did to A. Don't forget to start with a brand new identity matrix when you're creating your second elementary matrix. Our second elementary matrix is going to represent row 2 minus 3 row 1s. And that's going to come out like this. And last but not least, our final 
elementary matrix is going to represent the row operation 2 times row 3. So here is E3. Now our next step is to create all of the inverses of those three elementary matrices that we just saw. And the reason is as follows. What we have, based on our previous theory, is that A times the three elementary matrices gives us an identity matrix. And what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to rearrange this equation to solve for A. And we can do that by flipping the order of the elementary matrices and then applying the inverse to all of them. So this equation here is what we're after. We're after E1 inverse, E2 inverse, and E3 inverse. In this step is where we can use the ideas from the previous lesson. So take a look at E1. What type of elementary matrix is this? Well, E1 represents a switch of two rows. And that means that E1 inverse is going to be the same thing as E1. Next, take a look at E2. E2 represents an addition or subtraction of one row from another row. That means in order to find the inverse of E2, we're going to change the sign of the number that's not on the main diagonal. And E3 represents multiplication by a non-zero number. And we know in these cases, to find the inverse of that elementary matrix, we find the number that's not 1 on the main diagonal, and we take the reciprocal. And of course, our last step here is to write everything out in the correct order. I can't stress enough that it has to be in the correct order. We need A, in our case, to be equal to the following expression. And here it is with all of our elementary matrices in place. So a couple of questions and notes as we end off this lesson. The first one is, you may have been wondering if there are other decompositions of matrices besides into elementary matrices. And the answer is yes. One of the more common decompositions is called LU decomposition, where you decompose a given matrix into an upper and a lower triangular matrix. Your textbook likely does have LU decomposition in it, so if you're interested, you can definitely take a look at that. Now another question that I get asked quite a bit from students is, what is the usefulness of this kind of matrix decomposition where we break it up into elementary matrices? And that's an excellent question. And I want to kind of relate this to what we call prime decomposition for regular numbers. So if we took the number 12, we could write this as 6 times 2 or 3 times 2 times 2. So what we have done here is we've actually taken the number 12 and we break it up into what we call prime factors, 3 and 2. And this is similar to what we're doing for our matrix. We're taking our matrix A and we're trying to break it up into smaller and easier pieces to work with. And those smaller and easier pieces are called elementary matrices. Most of our elementary matrices are upper and lower triangular matrices. Some of them happen to also be diagonal matrices, which are, in some sense, the best kind of matrix to work with. If you go on to take linear algebra 2, there's a whole section devoted just to diagonalizing matrices, because it's so useful to have a diagonal matrix. And the last thing I have to say is more of a warning than anything else, and that is to be really careful. The order of matrix multiplication is important. So, for example, E1, E2, E3 is different from the multiplication E3, E2, E1. So take the time to go back and really look at those formulas that we have and those special theorems from the last few lessons and make sure that you really understand the order of your elementary matrix multiplication. All right, my little epsilons, stay positive.